Okay, we want to begin this morning, and let me re- have a, you re- what, read this passage of Scripture with me. Or I'll read it, and you can follow along. It's in Psalm 122, and then we'll have a word of prayer. The psalm goes this way. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built is a city that is compact together to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper that love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Father in heaven, we commit this time to you this morning. Be glorified as we look at your word together. Help us to see clearly the truths that you have presented there. And we just pray they'll be meaningful to our hearts today. Pray again for those who are not well today. Ask for your touch of healing upon them. We just again praise you for your presence and your power. Work in our midst in Christ's name. Amen. Let me just, there are questions that have come up recently about what's happening prophetically, and I want to take you to a focus that really we need to keep in mind. We talk about Israel, and Israel is, I mean, there are a constant unrest there at the present time from without. And uh, even this morning, uh, things taking place there, bombing, so forth like that. With regard to that, I just want you to understand something. The focus of God is on the city of Jerusalem. You can talk about the nation if you will, you can talk about how expanded it will be, but the city is the focus of God's attention. This city, see the multifaceted ways here. This city, the city of Jerusalem. The center of so much the unrest is located right there. By the way, <clears throat> there are the Psalms of Ascent, as it's saying, as they went up to Jerusalem, but also they sing them as they go up the stairs into the place of worship. If my wife was healthier than she is, I would have had her play Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Last night I lay asleep, I had a dream so far. I was in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. Amazing city, the center of God's attention in the past and in the future. Now, I bring you this picture. We, this, is, this is the Mount of Olives. As you look out, let me go back. As you look out from Jerusalem, from the city like this, and you look out, you will see across the Kidron Valley, you will see this, the Mount of Olives. By the way, it is here where he spent so much of his last days on earth. It's here where he will come back to when he comes again. He's going to stand on this Mount of Olives, divided in half to free the people of Israel so that they can be freed from the, the danger that is coming. But I want you just one thing to keep in mind. Right up here, as you come in here like this, coming in, it right back over the hill there is, is Bethany. We'll come to that in a while. It's where Lazarus lived, Right? And <clears throat> when Jesus came over from there, he came to the Mount of Olives. He would then come down through this Kidron Valley, which is right in front of us. The Mount of Olives. Now, this is being taken from the Mount of Olives, the picture is. So you come down through this Kidron Valley into the city of Jerusalem. And so much of the last days of Christ was up in the Mount of Olives, looking down over the city. And uh, this is the city where so focal to what God has to do. But I want to talk to you about how central that city is. Now, <clears throat> with this regard, turn with me if you go to 1 Kings chapter 11. It's just, it's fascinating how God will say over and over again this fact. Now, what I want to look at today is the centrality of Jerusalem in the Old Testament, then the centrality of Jerusalem in the Gospels, then the centrality of Jerusalem in the prophetic books, both Revelation and, if you will, books like Zechariah, which we'll look at briefly today as well. 
Now, the Centralic Jerusalem in the Old Testament. Now, listen to these Psalms. I'm going to start. In this 1 Kings 11, 11 to 13, follow along with me, if you will, in your Bibles. And he says, this notice, So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this thing, and you have not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, notice this, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David, and notice, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. To a reason, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it because of David, and I'm not going to do it because of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. You remember that, as, as the comment was, as they went through the wilderness, God wasn't demanding that they give him a place to put a permanent dwelling place. But when they decided to do so, it was Jerusalem he chose for this to be. Go with me, if you will, to the same chapter, chapter 11, verses 31 to 36. I start in verse 31. And say, he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. He had a garment that was torn twelve pieces. He says, Take ten of them. For he says, he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give, it to, give you ten tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. See, out of all the tribes, I've chosen this one city, the city of Jerusalem, because they have forsaken me, have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the daughter of Moab, Milcom, the daughter of the sons of Ammon, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances, as Father David did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler over all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, I, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. And then he goes on notice again. Verse 36, But to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name. Chapter 15, and verses 4 through 5, if you will. I mean, this is a recurring theme. It doesn't just happen once. It happens over and over again. <clears throat> Notice, but for David's sake, verse 4, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had, had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Let me just do the psalm. Notice the psalm, and you can see it up here. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her needy with bread. Her priests also I will clothe the salvation. Another and her godly ones will sing aloud for joy. There I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall shine. The Lord has chosen Zion. Notice again, <clears throat> this is interesting because this is the time Hezekiah, is going to have the kingdom taken from him in time, not in his lifetime again. It will happen later. But notice, in, and this is in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 24. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 29 to 34. I'll be with you in a moment. Well, it's easy. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 19, <clears throat> verses 29 through 34. Then this shall be a sign for, the, for you. You shall eat this year what grows of itself. In other words, Sennacherib has come and uh, threatened to take again away the kingdom. But he says, don't you worry. You're going to be here this year. You're going to be here next year too, notice. 
In the second year, what springs from the same? And in the third year, sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord shall perform this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. Neither shall he come before it with a shield, nor throw up a mound against it. But the way that he came, by that same he shall return, and he shall not come to this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. The city, important to God. But now, I won't take you somewhere. I won't go to the Gospels with me. Now, as the Old Testament, no, no doubt, is clearly set there. Now, I bring you to the Gospels. I could go to any of the Gospels, but Luke is so pointedly pointing this out. The centrality of Jerusalem in the book of Luke is no doubt. Now, let me just give you, <clears throat> as you look at the book of Luke, four major divisions, as I would do it here. Jesus' ministry preparation, those are the days of his birth and his growth and his baptism and temptation and so forth. Then Jesus ministers in Galilee. He leaves there. He goes up to Galilee. He ministers there. Then, starting in chapter 951, 50, 951 and following, Jesus starts toward Jerusalem. And the focus from that point on is on Jerusalem as a city. And then finally down here. By the way, in the initial stages, he prepares the way for this because you remember Jesus' first recorded trip to Jerusalem was when he went with his parents when he was young, right? And left again, or he stayed behind, and they thought he was with the group and so forth. But he introduces Jerusalem Murray in the life of Jesus. But, so first of all, there's Jesus' preparation for life and ministry. That's in chapter 1, 1 to 4, 13. Then Jesus ministry in Galilee, as we suggested. Then comes this verse. Now, I just watch this. And it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension, not for his death, not for his burial, not for his resurrection, for his ascension. Time to go back home. But the first thing, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. He had to do that. Now, as you look at this, then, all that you find from this point on throughout the remainder of this gospel is, is noting something quite important. The focus is on Jerusalem. Everything is about Jerusalem. It's heading there. Watch this with me. Notice, if you will, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem in 19. Well, that's okay. Go with me to Luke. It's the best you do that. And we look directly. Luke chapter 9. And you start in verse 51, and you'll notice that there he begins the statement. But notice what happens subsequent to this. In chapter 9, verse 51, we have the statement then. Notice just two verses later. In chapter 9 and verse 53. It says this, and they did not receive him. Why? Because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. He comes into, the, into Samaria. And when the Samaritans saw that he was headed toward Jerusalem, they did not receive him. Now go with me, if you will, to chapter 13. Same book, chapter 13. And just you'll just notice how this runs through here. Chapter 13 and verse 22. You notice in here it says he was passing through from one city and village to another. But notice this, and is proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Notice if you go with me further to chapter 13 and verse 33. Nevertheless, he says, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. And then comes this amazing statement of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers a brood under her wings and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is who comes in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem. We notice, <clears throat> then it says in chapter 17, when he's on his way to Jerusalem, that he was passing through Samaria and Galilee. And he took the 12 aside and said, Behold, we're going to Jerusalem. And all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man must be accomplished, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked 
and mistreated and spit upon, and after they scourge him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. And then in chapter 19, he went on to tell the parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed the kingdom was going to appear immediately. Again, as he comes to Jerusalem, their thought, he's going to establish the kingdom immediately. He says, oh no. He says, I need to tell you a parable because you need to understand that's not what's going to happen. And then in chapter 19, in verse 28, we read this. And after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, ascending to Jerusalem. Ascending, you remember, you have to climb up that hill to get into Jerusalem. It's interesting, by the way, as you look at this, he was going on ahead. Oh, no, no, he was resolutely, he had resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. He wasn't behind, he wasn't in the group, he was leading the way. He knew where he was going, he resolutely set his face to be there, and he now leads the way as they head up into Jerusalem. And then notice what it says, and it came about, when he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mouth that is called Olivet, remember, well, let me show you. I'll come back there. See, it's right behind here, and he's coming right to the Mount of Olives, and Bethany is right behind there. He comes over to Bethany, comes down through the Kidron Valley, up into Jerusalem. I take you back again. And notice what he says. When he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go in the village opposite you, in which you will enter. In which you, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat upon. Untie him and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Thus shall you speak, the Lord has need of him. And you understand what happened. He got on the colt, he came into Jerusalem, and the great triumphal entry that follows this passage. Now, with regard to this, just to show to you, there's, there's no doubt you go in the Old Testament, the focus on Jerusalem. As you go into the New Testament, the Gospels, the focus is on Jerusalem. We saw, again, as he comes to this point, the first section is his growth. The second section is where he's ministering. He chooses the disciples. He sends them out. And then comes this incredible verse that opens up the door and starts the direction toward Jerusalem. And from that point on, everything is going to go. The whole focus of his Jesus journey is again going from Galilee to Jerusalem. Now, now let me see if I can show you this. And I'll show you a couple of these as we look at this. It's interesting because the when he goes on his way to Jerusalem, the first section of this is he leaves Galilee to go to Jerusalem. That we see at the very introductory part. The second phase is he ministers and pray. I'll show you this in a moment. And the third phase is he vo he goes right into Jerusalem. And by the way, when he gets in Jerusalem, when he approached, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you had been known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you, and your enemies will throw up a bank before you, and surround you, and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground, and your children within you, and they will not leave you one stone, leave not one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. This, as he stood over the city of Jerusalem. This is, <clears throat> if you will, for a bit here, we see this. Um, the section is Judea, where Jerusalem is. That's, that's where he's headed, all right? Where he's been ministering is up here in Galilee. That's where he began his journey in Luke 9, 51 and following. He then is going to go down into the area of Perea. And there he's going to minister as he works his way down into Jerusalem. If you will, he's up in Galilee. By the way, that area is controlled by Herod Antipas. You have these, these section down Judea that originally had Archelaus over it. He was put out pretty quickly. The Romans took over. But Antipas was up there, and Antipas was already always also down here. Just, just a, br a brief uh, aside here. Antipas ruled these two. But Antipas would stay quite a bit down in the southern part in Perea here. And, and uh, there could be a reason. He had married the daughter of one of the kings down there, Nabataean king. And, and many times what you married, you married in order to make a pact between the two nations because they weren't going to attack you if, your grand, if their grandkids were up there. That's why they could do, they would do that. But he, 
Herod Antipas had a problem with women. You know, he was at this point, he then married his brother's wife, no less. That's what John the Baptist cited him for. But he would stay down here, possibly to protect the southern flanks from this distraught father-in-law. But enough of that. It is down in this section. Well, let me go back here. It is down in this section right in here where John the Baptist was ministering when he cited the fact that Herod should not be living with the wife he's living with because it was his brother's wife. It was then that his, you remember, he was killed, John the Baptist. So when Jesus came to the Prean area, I'll go back in. When Jesus came down to this area, they asked him the question about divorce again. I, it would seem that they were anticipating the same thing would happen to Jesus if he spoke out on divorce as happened to John the Baptist when he spoke out. But that's Priam. And that's where Herod Antipas ruled in both of those areas. And it was down here, as I suggest, that uh, that's where he put to death John the Baptist. Now, then of course he's going toward Judea, which is under Roman rule. So it was again this, the first stage of the journey was from, Gent uh, from Galilee down to Priya, and the last stage from Priya to Jerusalem. Or if you will, here's the thing, if you want to go from Galilee to Jerusalem, you can go straight down through Samaria, but they chose not to go often the straight way because of the Samaritan's attitude toward them, and they often went through Perea and then down into here. So that, that's the breakdown. But the whole point of it is he's heading, the minute he leaves there, he's heading toward Jerusalem, as 951 tells us, and 953 tells us, and all those other verses that we read. And then, of course, when he comes to Jerusalem, the ministry there is triumphal entry, weeping over the city, the Olivet Discourse, amazing discourse, and then he dies in Jerusalem, and then he rises again, and the empty tomb and the road to Emmaus. But the whole point of this, if you look at the majority of the book of Luke, it's focused on the city of Jerusalem. Now, let me take you now to the next step. If you look in prophecy, the focus is on the city. See, so when you listen to the news, watch Jerusalem. It's, it's where it all is. It's where it's going to be in the future is where Jesus will again intersect with the opponents of Israel. I remind you again that God controls through his word, and in his word he is exactly true about all he says, and it's going to happen just as he says it will happen. So I take your attention now, if you will to the book of Zechariah. Go with me there to Zechariah chapter 1. And, and we're going to, I'll show you the breakdown in just a moment, but let me give you a background to Zechariah. Let, let me do this for you first of all. Zechariah is one of the 12 minor prophets, okay? There's you understand this. They're, they're the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. By the way, it's amazing how little we know about Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, but go, go sometime in your Bible and see how many pages are given to those three books, which should tell us how much we should know about those books. Then there are the minor prophets. Now, it's interesting because it's one of the three post-exilic prophets. Hosea to Zephaniah are pre-exilic. They're before the exile. These three are after the exile. Fascinating because when you look at Isaiah, for example, he will give you the Jewish king or the king of Judah that he's ministering under. When you come to Haggai and Zechariah, they will give it under the name of a Gentile ruler. Is what Jesus described as the time of the Gentiles, and it started at that point in time where the Gentiles were the ascendancy, and it will revert back when Christ will come again. Now, I want to show you just something out of interest, okay? When they divided their Bible up, their Old Testament, they divided the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's how it was from beginning to end. Well, now, you know the law. It's his Genesis, and then it's the four other Pentateuchal books, okay? Then there are prophets. Now, you wouldn't expect this, but Joshua and Judges, Samuel and Kings, are all under the former prophets. That's the Jewish way of looking at this. Um, significant, of course. Why not Samuel? Samuel, of course, was just that. But it's interesting, by the way, you'll notice Samuel and Kings here, but notice how far they're removed from Chronicles, which is yet another book that we put with, uh, in conjunction with those. They were the latter prophets. They were the major ones. They're the minor ones. 
Now, then there are the writings. Now, it, it's important you look at this because the poetic books, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, the Rolls, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, then the historical books, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Now, now, what's fascinating, when Jesus was on earth, he was condemning them because they had shed so much blood, uh, blood of godly people. He says, all the way from Abel to Zechariah. You say, what's that, why is that so important? Because Abel was killed in the first part of Genesis. Zechariah was killed in the last part of Second Chronicles. And what he's saying, all the blood that was shed throughout the whole of the Old Testament, he says, comes up against you. From We would say from Genesis to Revelation. They would say from Genesis to Second Chronicles. So when Jesus makes that statement, it's not just about those two men. It's about all the people in between who died for the cause of God all the way from the book of Genesis to the last book of the Old Testament, which is Second Chronicles. Now, that's just an aside. Let me, go, let me take you further now. So here's where we are. We are Zechariah. He is the post exilic prophet. Now, there, there are three divisions of this book. There are first six chapters, which are prophetic in nature. Then there are the last six chapters, which are prophetic. And then there are two chapters in between where he challenges his people. Now, I've, I've pictured it this way, if you will. And we'll keep coming back to this over and over again here. But the, the, the first prophetic section is there. And there are eight night visions. Every one of those little things is, an eight, is a vision. We're going to look at three of them today. But again, I want to go through them in a hurry because I want to make a point. I, I don't want you to be lost in the process here. So the first part of this book is prophetic, and the latter part of this book is prophetic. And it's interesting, those are eight night visions, these are two burdens. You'll find the first one in chapter 9, verse 1, the second one in chapter 12, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord. Then in between, as we suggest to you, are, is the challenge to his people. Now, with regard to this now, we're gonna, I'm going to take you those first three visions, if you will, which start in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7, and, and again, we don't, we, we'll take them more quickly than not, because here's the point. Israel needs hope. Israel needs hope. They, they need hope today. And, and if you think that there is great adversity in Israel today, and there is, you heard about the family where they slaughtered the mother and father and some of the children in front of the others. It's just, it's, it's pathetic what's going on there now. They're trying to raise a bit of unrest, as they say, but not to lead to an alt-right war there with Israel. But they're trying to create all the unrest they can. But if you think it's bad in Israel today and in Jerusalem today, it's going to get worse, much worse. But you see, in the midst of this, God wants them to know that there's hope in the midst of adversity. And the focus is, again, on the city of Jerusalem. Walk with me. There, it's interesting because as you look at this, there are three questions we could ask. What's the future destiny of Israel as a nation? That's a good question. What's again the future destiny of the nations that oppose Israel, even today? And thirdly, what's the future destiny of the city of Jerusalem? I'm going to take you those three because what happens is they're, all, they're answered here. If you will, the first one is answered by the first vision. Second, Israel's enemies. Second, and then the third one is Jerusalem itself. But I want you to see that every one of them focuses on the city of Jerusalem. Walk with me. As I suggest to you, we've got the future of Israel as a nation. Here we go. Now, it's interesting what God does at this point. He promises compassion and care in, in vision number one. Now, just watch that with me as you look here. here here's, again, our configuration of the book. I take you back. This is vision number one. Walk with me. I'm not going to do all of it, but let me read it for you. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, as follows. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding a red horse. The Lord Jesus, if you will. He was standing among the myrtle trees, Israel, if you will, which were in the ravine. Actually, it's in a deep place, a place of depression, a place of diversity. But there were red, sorrel, and white horses behind him. And I asked, what are these? It's nice he asked the question so we get a configuration of this. And the angel who was speaking with me, by the way, there's, there's the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's this interpreting angel who sits there and explains all of this to him. Okay, now. <clears throat> 
uh, said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth, those riders on the horses. You, you know what's interesting? God knows everything that happened to Israel today. He, he has his riders on horses, if you will, as the figure of this, going out over all the earth, looking to see what's happening to Israel and coming back to give him a report. Okay, so this is what's happening. So the answer of the angel of the Lord, who was standing among the myrtle trees, okay, that's the Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. Okay, because these are who the Lord has sent, so they answered him, and they said, we have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. You, you know, it, it isn't that. There's no unrest. Uh -uh -uh. It's, it is that they're all satisfied that everything is copacetic. Everything is going okay, but it's not going okay. Then the angel of the Lord answered, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice something here which is fascinating. I'm going quickly through this, so I'm not going to do all this, but I just, it's interesting as you look at this. Uh, the, the Lord Jesus, the myrtle tree symbolizes Israel. The deep place, in, it talks about the great adversity. The horses are the messengers of the Lord. But look at this. This is the Lord Jesus Christ asking God the Father this question. O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou have no compassion for Jerusalem? How, how long does Jerusalem have to go through this? It's interesting as the Lord Jesus Christ asking the Father that. What? Again, I just tell you, he has great, great concern for Israel, if you will. In fact, notice if you will go with me to verse 14. Proclaim, I'm in the middle of the verse. Proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of us, I am exceedingly zealous for Jerusalem and Zion. I was in an evangelical theological society in the year 2000. And they focused on Israel and Israel's future and so forth prophetically. And there were a bunch, quite a few uh, believers, true believers, but they were Arabs. Some of them were. Some of the Arabs truly believed that this is okay, but some of them were Arab believers, and they are, and, and even some Gentile believers. How is it possible that God will show preference the city of Jerusalem over against other cities, or this nation over against other nations? You know what? It's God's choice as to what he's done. But there were people who were very, very strongly against that, the fact that God in some way would treat Jerusalem and Israel with favor. Um, amazing. But notice this. God says, I am extremely zealous for Jerusalem and Zion. That's why I asked the Father, how much longer does Jerusalem have to go through this? How much longer? It's fascinating because, as I said, with, with these horses that patrol the earth, notice what it is. It says that they were sent to patrol the earth, and they came back and answered to the Lord. He's, he knows everything that's happening today. You know that. He's omniscient. And he's keeping track of everything the nations are doing against Israel today. And he's keeping track of Israel itself. Let me take you further. So it's interesting because it's happened, okay? And, and they came back, and, and so he asked this question. But notice, it's interesting because you come to this, the summary of the vision. God granted has a great love for his people. 114, I just read it to you. I am extremely, exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. I put my name there. That's why I let my house be built. I'm going to show you something in a moment. So extremely zealous for them. God says, I have great displeasure with the nations, verse 15. But I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease. See, they're at ease. They, they think everything's okay. Life is going good. We have it under control. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, says Lord, I will return. Notice, I love this. Let me, let me do this. The comforting words. I'm going to return to Jerusalem. Now, I'm not going to turn to Israel. I'm going to return to Jerusalem, he says. Notice the I will return to Jerusalem with compassion, he says. Excuse me. My house will be built in Jerusalem. I'm going to build a house there. My house. Notice something else? Notice, go down there, if, if you will, in, um, let's see, verse 17. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord, my cities will again overflow with prosperity. 
Jerusalem's going to grow. We're going to see this in the last vision. It's just going to grow. So much so that there's no way you can even have walls that can contain it will be so big as the city of Jerusalem. I, it's interesting because I lived in Chicago for a while. I remember when I was in high school, it was fun to go into the city on a Saturday. I've done this with friends, and we just get on the L, which is that that uh, railroad thing that, that connects the whole city. And you go whole, all the way around the whole city of Chicago, and it was just fun. Then I came back to L.A. in the fall of 59. <laughs> you don't know where the city ends and begins. It just rolls from one community to another. And, you know, Chicago, you could see where Chicago was. L.A., who knows where L.A. goes and how far it goes, right? So you look at this. But that's how Jerusalem, you won't be able to see the end of Jerusalem. It's just going to expand and expand. Notice, the Lord will again comfort Zion, and he will again choose Jerusalem. <laughs> the first vision, I'm going to give you words of comfort and encouragement, and it's all focused on the city, the city of Jerusalem. Go with me to vision number two. You see, the second question is, what's the destiny of the nations opposing Israel? Look at them today. And by the way, we are going to be tied in with that in time. I, I've said it for years. I, didn't, I, I could not imagine the, na the nation, the United States, going against Israel as a nation. But look what we're doing now. We're going to the United Nations to find out, you know, what they gain a consensus on, see. And I've said it for years, although there's no way I envisioned what's happening now, is that we will, again, put ourselves out of the United Nations. The United Nations will decide to go against Israel, and we will join the United Nations in going against Israel. It's going to be. Just read Zechariah 14, the first few verses. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem. One city. The whole world. The whole world against one city. You don't think they're scared of what's going to happen out of that one city? Okay, let me take you further. Okay, well, let me watch this, okay? So this promise of freedom. I'm going I'm to free you. Watch this. Here we are. Six, second vision, okay? Second vision, and here we are. Now, in the second vision, just, just let me read it for you, verse 18. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. Horns, symbol of power, nations that had great power. And I said, the angel was speaking to me, what are these? And he answered, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and notice Jerusalem. Okay, so they're, now, by the way, who are they? These are they. I just want to give you just briefly this, what is. Babylon was the first one. Then came Medo-Persia. Then came Greece. Then came Rome. Okay? Now, it's interesting because he looks at that and he says, what did they do? Notice, these are the horns of powerful nations which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. All over the world, Jewish people have been scattered because of the kingdoms that have come against the city of Jerusalem and the nation Israel. Okay? Now, watch this. So, they're four smiths. Notice what happens. Calls them craftsmen. And then I, I saw, then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these come to? And he says, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no one lifts up his head, but these craftsmen have come to terrify them, throw down the horns of the nations which have lifted up. By the way, notice, so because I said the horns of nations, look at here, the horns of the nations that have lifted up the horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. What's interesting, just, just, just a brief point here, just watch this. Medo-Persia defeated Babylon. That's the second kingdom that defeated the first one. Greece then defeated Medo-Persia. That's Alexander the Great coming over. Then when Alexander the Great dies, his people cannot continue, can continue the empire, so Rome takes over. And then finally the Lord Jesus Christ would come back and defeat the empires that exist today, which are the extension of the Roman Empire. Now watch this. I take you now to this last one. Then what's going to happen to Jerusalem? It's in all these, but watch this, okay. There's a promise of prosperity for Jerusalem. So now let's go. I lift up my eyes, chapter 2, verse 1. And by the way, this is the third of these night visions, the last one we'll look at. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I said, where are you going? And he said, to measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. 
And behold, the angel was speaking with me, was going out. Another angel was coming out to meet him and said, Run, speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I declare there will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Now, let me just quickly take here. The vision, there's a surveyor, he's surveying, and, and the other participants, but just quickly. It's interesting, okay? Look at this, just to see it. Run, speak the What's the whole point of this? They're trying to measure Jerusalem, and they can't do it. It's too big, way too big. Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls. The, 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 the walls around you can't put walls to contain it because it's going to go out, out, out. You know what? All this business about our country trying to tell them where they can build. Let me tell you, in that day, nobody's going to stop them from building. It's just going to spread and spread and spread and spread. Notice this. You see, if you can't have walls, then you've got a problem because the reason they built walls was for protection, right? You built walls to keep people out. For example, when Alexander came down, Tyre was out, on the, out in the water a bit on a little island, and they built these hard, large walls. We're told somebody says they're 150 feet high. It seems awful high. They were high. But you know why the walls, again, for protection? You take those walls down, and there is not that protection for the city. So how, and notice this, if in fact Jerusalem is going to be that big, and if in fact it has no walls, by the way, when we were in Israel with a group in 2000, it was interesting, we're standing looking over the countryside, and all of a sudden we, the purpose we were there is because there's an airport there, it's, it's, a, it's a military one, and the airplanes are underground so they cannot be destroyed, and they come up on these elevators, and then you see them just take off, and they circle and go right over your head. You know, you you feel at peace in Israel because of the Air Force. It's an amazing thing. But you know, on that day, all the nations come against Israel. You think about this just now. Uh, what chance does Gaddafi have? Now, he might survive this. But you have all the nations coming against him with these, you know, rockets they're shooting in and planes are doing what they do with. They're doing all this stuff, and uh, he may survive, but well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's one man. I don't even say good or bad. It doesn't matter. It's just against it. It will be that way with Jerusalem one day. It will be. And they'll justify it. They will justify it. But he says, I, notice. Right, let, me, let me go down further. Notice what happens. He says, if you will look at it, Jerusalem will expand. It's going to be so big you can't even put a wall around it. And I will be the glory in her midst, he says in verse 5. But now notice. He says, you know what? It will, okay, let me, okay, well, let me put this, no hole there. Flee from the land of the north, this, verse 6 and so forth. I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Hosein escape those who are living with the daughter of Babylon. In other words, come home. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory, he has sent me against the nations that plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You just think about that. You just, you, when you, that's a great picture. You look at the eye. You see how much protection God's given the eye? Look at the bones on either side here to keep anything from hitting the eye. Then God's giving you eyelids that automatically go shut when something starts toward you. Then God's given us eyelashes. Then God's given us tears. All to protect the eye. Those who touch Jerusalem have touched the apple of my eye. I put all of this around to protect it, and you see you've gone through, and you've touched the apple of the eye of God. Notice. But notice, if you will, for behold, I will wave my hand over them, so there will be plunder for slaves. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Notice. Sing for joy, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming. I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Notice this even. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord. You know what? Not only will Jewish people come, but Gentile people are going to come as well. But notice God's going to protect it. He's going to be a divine protection. He was going to refill it, verses 6 and 7. He's going to bring people back from all over. He's going to see his enemies judge, verses 8 and 9. And then finally, he's going to pro to pro provide, prove God's protection in verses 10 to 13. Sing for joy, notice, many nations will join themselves to the Lord. And then notice, if you will, verse 12, the Lord will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. He's coming back. 
Now, I will say to you, you and I will not see the end of all this. We're just going to see what leads up to it. I'll tell you that. Unless God lets us see from the scope of heaven. But it's going to happen. And there's never been a time in the lifetime of any of us now living where, it, and by the way, understand, we don't live in the time of science. In other words, you say, well, this has to happen before the Lord comes back. Nothing has to happen before the Lord comes back. He could have come back 2,000 years ago. The only thing keeping him from back is his own timing. It's not like we have to see this happen before he can come back again. But you, when you look at what's going to happen in the end times, everything is in position right now in an amazing way. When you, when you listen to the news, you see what's happening in, in, again in Ethiopia. I mean, in, in um, Egypt, right below it. Been an enemy of Israel for years. Land of the north is not Russia, by the way. It's Babylon because you come from there like that. They didn't come across the desert. They followed the fertile crescent up. They came from the north. It's stated in scripture. It's not even the issue. But it comes from the north like that to attack. Look at the nations surrounding. I, I did last night. I went on a map last night just looking at all the nations surrounding Israel. Whether you have Egypt right below it. Whether you have Libya off to the left a bit. And, 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 and whether you have, you have again Iraq and Iran. Whether you have Syria that just massively surrounds it. And much of what Israel had is now there. So it's just when you look at all of this, it's going to happen. God is coming again. And I remind you again, the centrality of all that God did in the past and in the future. Centered on the city of Jerusalem. So as you read through scripture and you see the pray for the peace of Jerusalem, understand that this has such a focal point because it is a city though expanded so greatly right now is going to expand much further in the future going to expand for the glory of God and God says I do what I do for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of my city Jerusalem which I have chosen